for a number of years because I was a graduate student in Chicago and Professor Chandrasekhar was really always interested in younger students. He treated us almost as his equal, which you know, at the time we didn't realize what it meant. But as I grew older, I realized what a great privilege this was. Um, but I will begin today just going straight to science in this, in this particular talk, because I will have opportunity to make a few more remarks about Chandra uh, in the, this afternoon during the book release ceremony. So the title of my talk is the Big Bang and the Quantum. And what I would like to sort of tell you about is really how quantum physics can modify the general paradigms we have in the cosmological setting. More technically, what I'm going to tell you is about a specific approach to, quantum cosmo to cosmology, which comes from quantum gravity. And this approach is called loop quantum cosmology. Now, this is already a rather large subject. There are more than 500, could be even close to 1,000 papers on the subject by now. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to summarize the whole story. But I would like to give you some highlights. For st students particularly, there are pedagogical articles on this whole topic on our institute website. And for others, there's a short review, which is really Proceedings of a Cosmology Conference in Paris, which is available on the archives. Finally, I would like to emphasize that I'm not going to talk about just my own work. It is work of many, many people, some of whom the most important contributions that have been included are listed here. Okay. So I'd like to begin with a historical introduction to the Big Bang. General relativity is a theory of gravity, and it is distinguished from Newtonian theory because gravity is encoded in the very geometry of space-time. And as a result, since gravitational field is dynamical, space-time geometry itself becomes a physical and dynamical entity. And this is a conceptual, conceptual revolution which has given rise to spectacular consequences, particularly black holes and gravitational waves. And in this conference, Priya and Ramesh and others will tell us more, much more about black holes. But this fusion comes with a price. Now, space-time itself ends at the singularities. So normally, in kind of flat space physics, if a field becomes singular, well, that field becomes singular, but the rest of the dynamics can still go on. We have space-time. But now space-time itself ends at the singularity because if gravitational field diverges, then the geometry of space-time itself is singular. And therefore, in particular, we have the Big Bang, which we thought think as being the absolute beginning of space-time. Not only matter, but space and time itself are born at the Big Bang in general relativity. This idea or these solutions of Einstein's equation, which realized this idea, were found by uh, Friedman in the years 1921 to 24, and completely independently by Lemaitre, who worked on cosmology for many, many decades and who made fantastic contributions to the subject. So basically, this is not how they put it, but basically, logically, one can say that if we make an assumption that there is no preferred place in the universe, so we have got spatial homogeneity, and there is no preferred direction in the universe on large scale, so we have got isotropy, then this implies that the metric of space-time has a certain geometrical form, namely you have got minus gt squared, the time element, minus a scale factor squared, a squared of t times dx squared, where the scale factor depends only on time. That is why we have got spatially homogeneous, and there is no preferred direction. All spatial directions are put on the same footing. The volume goes like cube of the scale factor, and the curvature goes like some negative power of the scale factor. The power depends on the kind of matter field we have. Now, Einstein's equations imply that the volume goes to zero at some epoch. Of course, if the volume value goes to zero, then the scale factor goes to zero, 
which means the curvature becomes infinite, space time curvature blows up and this is the big bang and classical physics as we know it, physics of general relativity stops there. So, this was all sort of understood really in the 20s by thanks to the gentleman and I will speak a little bit more about that in a minute, but it really did not enter the mainstream of physics until essentially 50s and then 60s and this happened because of work of Gamow, Alpha, Harman and others in which they realized that if we look at the universe as a whole and if we look at the light elements in the universe, they had to be cooked somewhere and that oven was really provided to us by the early universe. And then Dickey, Peebles, Roland, Wilkinson realized that if in fact we had such a cosmological scenario, then there must be a cosmic microwave background, a sort of an afterglow um, and this uh, and, and, and with these two um, developments, cosmology entered the mainstream of physics. I just want to emphasize in passing that Gamow actually disliked the emphasis on the Big Bang or the beginning. He just wanted to emphasize that the universe is dynamical and Dickey also looked, disliked the absolute beginning and he preferred an oscillating universe. So, here is an artist's impression of a Big Bang. Basically, time is running upwards and spatial directions are these directions up here. So, time is running up here and space is represented like that. The universe is expanding as you go along and um, but if you go in the past, go down the time, then the fabric of space time breaks down and this is the, the big bang of general relativity. But in today, when students are taught about cosmology and so on, they are taught as though big bang is a fact. But in fact, there have been many twists and turns. In particular, Friedman, although he is the first one to really discover the Big Bang in technical sense, he, but his interest was really mathematical. He was delighted to prove that Einstein was wrong. Einstein thought that the universe was static and so on and, and Einstein also thought that Friedman had made a mistake in his paper and it took almost a year for Einstein to realize that Friedman was in fact right. So, Friedman was very del delighted to prove that Einstein was wrong, but he was not that interested in physics of solutions. For example, he found solutions in which energy is total energy is positive or energy density is negative. He was just looking at mathematical consequences of Einstein's equations. It was Lemaitre who understood the implications of this, uh, of, of this particular solutions. He really understood that this meant that the universe had a finite beginning, that the singularity was real. And in fact, he even ventured very early on to believe, to think that in fact, all matter might have been created near the Big Bang and he had this primeval atom idea which is in some heuristic qualitative sense is kind of the, um, the beginning of the idea of nucleosynthesis. So, the, the Lemaitre was a remarkable person. He fought in the First World War. He was Belgian. He won a medal for his, uh, actually it was a street to street fighting. Then he decided that he wanted to become a priest. So, he got ordained, he was a Catholic priest, but then he decided that he wanted to do science. So, he actually spent a year with Eddington, learned general relativity and then he discovered the solutions of Einstein of that I talked about. Then he went to United States at MIT to do a PhD in astrophysics and the application, he wrote an essay about um, you know what he wanted to do and it is even fantastic today because he is really saying that the natural home of general relativity is in astrophysics and these are the problems in astrophysics he want to apply to, uh, apply general relativity to. Um, in 1954, Gamow, Gamow was sort of a really exuberant person, wrote to the Pope saying that there is a big bang and there is nuclear synthesis, etc. Pope Pius XII immediately had this meeting in which he thought that science and Catholic religion are coming together and so on and so forth. But Lemaitre had the foresight to go and convince the Pope that one should keep the two things separate and the Pope never came back to this topic. In fact, there was a, the following year there was a meeting of astronomical society that Pope addressed and he never mentioned this again. So, he was a really remarkable person I think. I think he's underappreciated. That's why I'm saying all these things. Um, but anyway, but even afterwards, Einstein did not take the Big Bang and the big beginning very seriously. He suggested that inhomogeneities may be washed away. The inhomogeneities may wash the singularity away and this view persisted. For example, in the 50s and 60s, 
the Russian school under Kalatnikov and Lipschitz had a program to find the general solution to Einstein's equation, and they hoped that the solution would be singularity free. So again, not everybody believed that Big Bang was, was really there in general relativity. They thought it was an artifact of too many symmetries. Gamma disliked the term Big Bang and preferred the emphasis on dynamical universe, and he preferred to think that in fact the universe had a pre-Big Bang br branch. The paradigm shift really occurred because the singularity theorems of Hawking and, uh, of Hawking and um, sorry, Penrose and Hawking in the mid-60s. And qualitatively, what it says, these theorems say is that if matter satisfies certain energy conditions, local energy density is positive in certain sense, then according to general relativity, the cosmological space times will necessarily have a singularity. And so thus, Lemaitre's views were actually well realized. Um, the Big Bang term, yeah, Hoyle, exactly. Well, I, th that's why I was debating between Gamow and Hoyle, but I, I don't know. I think historically it was Hoyle who first used it, but Gamow did use the Big Bang later quite a bit. Uh, but the general expectation today is that, yes, it is a prediction of general relativity, but in fact, in this prediction, general relativity is pushed beyond the domain of applicability and because the circumstances near the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, are so extreme that quantum physics is very, very important, whereas general relativity ignores it completely. So we must in incorporate quantum physics. And the idea is that, for example, if you go back to the hydrogen atom, in classical electrodynamics, you calculate kind of the, the ground state energy, then you find that the ground state energy is, is minus infinity because the electron can sit at the center of the Coulomb potential. But in quantum mechanics, it is bounded below by H bar. H bar comes to the rescue, and this is the ground state energy. And so similarly, the idea was, idea has been that the singularities are predictions of general relativity, but once you bring in quantum physics, H bar will come to our rescue, and singularities will disappear. So basically, Big Bang is a prediction of general relativity precisely in a domain in which it is inapplicable. So because of this, in fact, I, feel, I believe that the right attitude is that classical singularities of general relativity are gates to physics beyond Einstein. And that is why it is nice to focus on this issue. Now, one might say, any viable theory of quantum gravity should answer the question, what really happened in the Planck regime? Now, one often hears, even in scientific circles, the statement that, well, in the standard cosmological model, there is a, we know that there is a cosmic microwave background that proves that there was a Big Bang. But in fact, cosmic, micro, cosmic uh, background really took, occurs 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And similarly, one might say, what about inflation? Well, at the onset of inflation, matter density is ten, less than 10 to the minus 11 times Planck density. So these really occur way beyond, I mean, when quantum gravity effects are completely negligible. So therefore, these are far from proofs that Big Bang actually occurred. So the question is, does the quantum physics really stop if we went further back? Is there a beginning? If not, um, if in fact physics does not stop there, then what was really there before general relativity becomes applicable? Now, so the goal of this talk is to show that in cosmological models, quantum physics does not stop at singularities. Quantum geometry extends its life, and the models I will consider in this particular talk are simple, but in contrast to string theory, for example, singularities that are, that are treated in these models are of direct physical interest. They are not kind of orbifold singularities, they are not singularities in higher dimensions, they are really cosmological singularities that we are all interested in. And I will focus on conceptual mathematical physics issues, and at the end, speak a little bit about observational phenomenological predictions. So what is the idea? Well, the idea in loop quantum gravity is to retain this duality between gravity and geometry, which, but, uh, and new, but new physics now in the quantum Riemannian geometry. And this quantum Riemannian geometry was developed rigorously in the mid-90s. And the idea is that space-time should be described, quantum space-time should be described geometrically, but using quantum geometry. And then one has to see what the ramifications of this quantum geometry are. 
So this is the idea, and then we now want to show what we want to examine what happens when you apply these ideas to cosmology. So the talk has five parts. We finished the first part already, and then second part is conceptual setting, and what was the status in quantum cosmology before loop quantum cosmology, then the paradigm shift that is caused by loop quantum cosmology, and then illustrative applications on conceptual and phenomenological uh, uh, issues, and then uh, summary. Okay, so conceptual set. Well, there are some long standing questions that have been with us for a very, very long time, which are expected to be answered by quantum, the quantum theories of gravity from first principles. First, how close to the Big Bang does a smooth space time of general relativity and a quantum field theory on it make sense? So, for example, one assumes that at the onset of Gut era, everything can, can be described using ordinary quantum field theory on a given space time of classical space time. Can you justify this from first principles? Is the Big Bang singularity naturally resolved by quantum gravity? Well, as we will see in a minute, in the older quantum cosmologies, the answer is no in the so-called wheeler debit theory. Then, well, singularity is, Big Bang singularity at the beginning is a kind of a funny place. Perhaps we need a new principle or a new boundary condition at the Big Bang. So new input is needed maybe in order to do physics. And this was, for example, the proposal, Hartle and Hawking, so-called no boundary proposal, which really is a boundary condition at the initial so, what, singularity. Is the quantum evolution across the singularity deterministic? If in fact Big Bang singularity is resolved, can we go back? Can you, this, this time, can I go back in time to the Big Bang in a deterministic way? And then if I can, then what is there on the other side? Is there a quantum form and somehow space time is classical space time becomes frozen out of this quantum form near what we call Big Bang? Or in fact, is there a class, smooth classical universe on the other side? And the fascinating thing is that there is a very interesting history even within classical general relativity. Lemaitre, Tolman, Gamow, Zanstra, Sakharov, and Weinberg have introduced, have expressed their own prejudices as to what really happened, what should really happen if we go beyond general relativity. Now one might say, okay, these questions are obvious, these questions are old, why have they not been answered? But from my perspective, the big, big problem is the following. There's a tension between ultraviolet properties and the infrared properties. Supposing quantum gravity effects are very strong and they change physics so dramatically near the Big Bang that the singularity is resolved. Infinite forces that classical gravity says must be there are somehow diluted away. Then these effects must be very, very strong near the Big Bang. Now it may be happen that as we go away from the Big Bang, these effects die. But still, they, they cannot just go, go to zero immediately. And the universe has had 14 billion years to evolve. Therefore, even these tiny effects could add up so that today we might get a discrepancy with general relativity. But we find that general relativity works perfectly well. So the burden is twofold. On the other hand, on the one hand, we must have these quantum effects to be so strong as to resolve the Big Bang singularity. On the other hand, we want these quantum effects to die off very, very quickly so that today or even at the you know, very early and even at the onset of gut era, classical general relativity is a perfectly good, approx good approximation. And this is the ultraviolet and the infrared tension. Ultraviolet should resolve the singularity. Infrared, already in the gut epoch, classical space time should be perfectly fine. So can a theory do this? And this, is a, this has been the big challenge. If you take background dependent perturbative approaches, they start by perturbation theory, so they assume that you've got a classical space time, so they don't have any problem in getting general relativity, the infrared regime, but they have a big problem in resolving the Big Bang singularity. If you take background independent approaches, then typically you can resolve the ultraviolet difficulty, but in doing so, you come up with a prediction that in fact, the today general relativity should not be valid. So there is a tension, and this has been the main difficulty. Now, these questions have been with us for 30 or 40 years since the pioneer work of David, Misner, and Wheeler. And the interesting thing is that over the last five years or so, 
In loop quantum cosmology, these issues have been resolved for general homogeneous cosmological models, which are called Bianchi space times. And this has been done in great mathematical detail. Physical observables, which are classically singular, such as mass matter density, they have been promoted in a rigorous way as operators in the physical Hilbert space and shown that they have dynamically induced upper bounds. So they don't and this is a mathematically rigorous and conceptually complete framework in this that has, that has come up up here. So the, in the, emer the emerging scenario is in these simplest models, there are vast classical regions bridged deterministically by quantum geometry. So we do not need a new principle, such as the hawking hartle um, bound, no boundary proposal, um, to join the pre-Big Bang and the post-Big Bang branches. And the evolution across the singularity is completely regular, just with quantum Einstein's equations coming from loop quantum cosmology. So this was the impression of a Big Bang in general relativity. This is replaced by this kind of picture in, um, in loop quantum cosmology. This branch, expanding branch, would be what in general relativity would happen. Then the space-time fabric would be broken up here. But in loop quantum cosmology, this is not broken. The evolution is continuous. It's perfectly well defined across. But here, we've got a deep quantum region where general relativity equations are completely violated. There are new physical effects that come up here. And that is what we study. And then in the past, again, the curvature dilutes. And general relativity is valid here. So, so we got a nice, huge universe, which is well described by general relativity. Another nice whole universe. This is a contracting one. This is expanding one, well described by general relativity. And they are joined together here by quantum bridge provided by loop quantum cosmology. So let us go in some detail. Let us take the simplest k equal to 0 Friedman Robertson, Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker model. And let us couple it to massless scalar field. There are many, many generalizations of this that have been done. But to begin with, let me just consider this simple case. This is instructive because in this model, every classical solution is singular. So you're not sort of, you know, if, every, if there are some classical solutions which are not singular, some are not, then it is not so dramatic. But if, in fact, if every classical solution is singular, and still in quantum theory, there is no singularity, it is pretty dramatic. And this provides a foundation for more complicated models. So we're going to scale field, and we're going to scale factor. So I'm plotting scalar field on the y-axis and the scale factor on the x-axis. But instead of the scale factor, what I do is I take some region in space-time, in, in, in space, or spatial volume, such as this glass, for example, and I look at the volume inside this glass. So in, according to general relativity, at this instant of time, there is some volume. But as time goes on, the, the universe expands, and therefore the volume that is inside this glass would actually expand like the cube of the scale factor. So I'm just plotting here the volume, which is the cube of the scale factor, if you like, um, of some fiducial cell, of some firm, fiducial firm glass. Like that. Okay. And then here are the trajectories. There, is a, there are solutions which start at the singularity, volume equal to zero, and expand out up here. And there are time reverse of this solution. We start with infinite volume and end their life in a big crunch. So I got two distinct like kinds of solutions. Now, in cosmology, in classical cosmology, you can just go and use a space time in a proper time, time as your time. But if you're looking at quantum cosmology, then you are looking at a whole bunch of space times together. And then it is not clear to know what exactly you mean by time. So what one does in cosmology is use some matter field or some component of the curvature, if you like, and use that as a clock. So here we can think of this scalar field as being the time, intrinsic time, not given by anybody else, but just no one else. Intrinsic time. And then we can say that, well, if at this value of the scalar field, the volume of the universe was so and so, I ask the theory to tell me what the volume of the universe would be at this value of the scalar field. So this plays the role of time, and this plays the role of More complicated a model, this will still be time. And here, you will have inhomogeneities. You will, here, you will have anisotropies. This will be multiple dimensional. So we can ask what happens in older 
cosmology. Well, since there are only a finite num number of degrees of freedom, we have got volume which depends only on time, so it is scale factor q, and we have got a scalar field, we have got only two degrees of freedom. So, all the field theoretical difficulties are pi past and analysis reduced to standard quantum mechanics. So, we have got quantum states, so state depends on v and phi only. V operator operates by multiplication, its conjugate momentum operates by derivation, and similarly for phi. And then quantum evolution is generated by one particular quantum Einstein's equation. Only one of the equations is important because of high degree of symmetry. And this quantum evolution equation is called was called the Vera David equation, which is a differential equation. And it says that d2 by dv square of the wave function is equal to constant times matter Hamiltonian operated on the wave function. Of course, there is some factor ordering ambiguity and that is uh, encoded here by some function f of v which will be different for different factor orderings. And what one finds is that without additional assumptions singularity is actually not resolved by the particular, um, particular equation. What does this mean? It means that if I start out here the wave function which is sharply peaked at this point and evolve it forward in time and backward in time. Well, if I evolve forward in time in the Wheeler David theory, it just follows this trajectory very well. That is good, good infrared behavior. But if I evolve it backward in time, then it turns out that in fact the wave function follows this trajectory right into the singularity and therefore the singularity is not. Therefore, the general belief since the 70s, and this was also my belief when I was growing up as a graduate student, that this is an impasse. We really cannot do better in spite of these brilliant ideas that cosmological singularities might be resolved by quantum effects. This is really not possible. Why? Because we have a system with finite number of degrees of freedom and for systems with finite number of degrees of freedom, there is only one way to do quantum mechanics and this is because of von Neumann's theorem. There is only one way to do quantum mechanics, then you know, we did that freedom we have is in this scale is in this factor ordering and that freedom is not sufficient to resolve the singularity. But we change dramatically. In loop quantum cosmology the situation is very different because of the underlying quantum Riemannian geometry that I mentioned to you about. So all people in, who are in theoretical physics here would ask how is this possible? What about the von Neumann uniqueness theorem? I mean what did loop quantum cosmology do for us? Which is qualitatively different. Well, in the Wheeler David or the older quantum cosmology, we did not have guidance from a full quantum gravity theory. Therefore, in quantum cosmology, one just followed standard quantum mechanics like the von Neumann theorem and constructed a Schrodinger representation of the fundamental Weyl algebra. By contrast, in the quantum kinematics of loop quantum gravity has been rigorously developed. And it turns out that there is a very powerful theorem due to this gentleman which shows that if you do not have any background structures, there is no background metric, it is a background independent approach, then in fact there is a unique representation of the kinematic algebra. If you put by hand the requirement, which is of course the most natural requirement for quantum gravity, that there should not be any background structures, then the statement is that there is a unique way of doing um, quantum gravity, there is a unique Hilbert space and operators and so on. And this is the arena to formulate quantum Einstein's equation. If you follow this procedure, um, so, so, so if one follows the procedure used in loop quantum gravity in, and uses it in cosmology, what one finds is that one of the assumptions of the von Neumann theorem is violated. So we always assume that von Neumann theorem tells us there is a unique way of doing quantum mechanics. And of course, every theorem has assumptions. The assumptions that von Neumann used are completely normal for ordinary quantum mechanics, but they turn out to be in conflict with background independence. This assumption is violated and therefore the uniqueness result is just bypassed. The theorem is not applicable. For mathematical physicists, I will just quickly go through the argument. What the von Neumann uniqueness theorem tells is the following. We can start with the operators um, x and p and they can construct their exponentials, these are u and v, then from the canonical commutation relations one finds 
that u and v satisfy these particular commutation relations, u times v is equal to phase factor times v times u. And furthermore, because of this, we are really have weak continuity in the parameters lambda and mu. Okay, so, so what Van Neumann's theorem says the following, it does the opposite. It forgets about this last line. It says that let us look for a representation of the one of the while commutation relations. These are the commutation relations. The unitary groups on a Hilbert space in which these operators are such that there is a weak continuity with respect to these two parameters. Then von Neumann tells us that this is the standard Schrodinger representation. What happens is that if you follow loop quantum gravity, then in fact the assumption that u of lambda, the continuous in lambda is violated. It cannot be continuous in lambda and therefore you have got inequivalent representations for cosmological models. That is to say, we have new quantum mechanics. And in this new quantum mechanics has a further additional property, very nice property, that novel features arise only in the deep Planck regime. If you are away from the Planck regime, then the predictions of this theory and the predictions of the de Witt theory are very, very, very close to each other. But in the deep Planck regime, they are very different. So what happens in quantum cosmology? Well, we have different Hilbert space and different kinematics, basically, different operators to use. And it turns out that the Wheeler David equation I wrote down is simply not well defined on this Hilbert space of loop quantum cosmology. So you have to start from scratch and try to kind of find the replacement of loop quantum gravity, a loop, a replacement of the Wheeler David equation in using the principles of loop quantum gravity. So quantum dynamics has to be built from scratch by incorporating quantum geometry of loop quantum gravity. And it turns out that when you do that, step by step is a very complicated, careful pro procedure that the wheeler david differential equation is replaced by a certain difference equation. In the wheeler david equation, we had on the left-hand side d2 v by dv squared. Here we got a second order difference, difference operator. Psi evaluated v plus 4 at v and v minus 4. The time variable is the same here is equal to the Hamiltonian operating on this. This is the same as in the wheeler david equation. Only the, math, math, only the geometrical part of the wheeler david equation is changed. In loop quantum gravity, the basic geometrical observables, such as areas and volumes, are quantized. If I want to know what is the area of a surface, for example, the surface of this glass, in classical general relativity, this takes on continuous values. But in quantum gravity or quantum geometry, this there is an operator and it only has discrete eigenvalues, like for example the energy levels of hydrogen atom. So this is the first thing. And in particular, there is the smallest non-zero eigenvalue, which is called the area gap. And it turns out that this step, I've suppressed, I've defined the variables to take out constants, but this four here up here is really completely governed by this area gap. So because we have got quantum geometry, that the difference, differential equation is replaced by difference equation. So long as the area gap is finite, you always have difference equation. If you take the limit that the area gap, go, gap goes to zero, we recover the wheeler david equation. So the wheeler david equation is an approximation which occurs if we ignore quantum geometry. In full loop quantum cosmology, we have to live with this particular equation. What are the consequences of the equation? So let us return to this k equals to 0, Friedman, Robertson, Walker, simplest model. Again, I got the state of field and I got the, the, uh, the volume up here. And I again I ask the question supposing I take this particular value in this phase diagram and actually construct a wave function which is sharply peaked at this particular point. And now I evolve it using the difference equation of loop quantum cosmology. I go backward, I go forward. And I ask what happens. Well, as I go forward in time, the universe becomes more and more classical. This is the trajectory of general relativity. Is the wave function peak along this trajectory as the universe goes, evolves? The answer is yes. The answer is the wave function is sharply peaked on this trajectory. If I evolve backward in time, what happens? Is the wave function sharply peaked on this trajectory as in the Wheeler David theory? In which case, you will just go into the singularity. The answer is no. So what happens is that as we evolve back in time, until the matter density is about a thousandth or one 
percent of Planck density. The, it follows general relativity trajectory perfectly well, but then there is a huge departure from general relativity trajectory. General relativity would take you down into the Big Bang. Instead, there is a repulsive force, and the universe bounces back. And then once the density becomes less than, again, one hundredth or one thousandth of Planck density, it joins on to general relativity trajectory without any problem. So there is a quantum bridge here, which is provided by this differential, differential equation of quantum cosmology, which is absent in with theory. Here is a computer simulation. The previous thing was also a computer simulation, but here I'm draw, plotting the wave function here, the absolute value of the wave function. Here is a scalar field. Here is a volume, and here is the absolute value of the scalar field. So I take a point, as in the previous diagram. I take a point like that, and I construct a wave function which is sharply peaked. I construct a wave function which is sharply peaked. I evolve it, and I evolve it. It follows a classical trajectory until a critical time when the densities are high enough, and then there is a bounce. Classical physics is violated here, and again it joins on to classical trajectory. So let me sum up. We assume that the quantum state is semi-classical at a late time and evolve it backward and forward. The state remains semi-classical until very early and very late times, until the density is about 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 of Planck density, scalar curve, the scalar curve which is upon 1 upon or 1 upon 1 tenth of a Planck, uh, 1 upon L Planck length squared. So this is the fact that we find from equations of loop quantum gravity. Thus, we know from first principles that space-time can be taken to be classical at the Gert scale, because at the Gert scale, the rho is about 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 times rho Planck, and already at 10 to the minus 3, less than 10 to the minus 3, general relativity is a good approximation. So we are one of the conditions. In the deep Planck regime, the classic algebra fails, but quantum evolution is well defined through the Planck regime. We just saw that the wave function has no difficulty in actually going into the deep Planck regime. This is a well defined, both mathematically and in a well defined evolution through what would have happened to the Big Bang. The Big Bang would, have, would mean that this wave function actually goes into zero volume. That does not happen. In the, um, so in the deep Planck regime, semi-classicality fails. By that I mean the wave function is no more classical. But quantum evolution is well defined and remains deterministic unlike other approaches. For example, there are approaches based on the, the uh, string theory, the pre-Big Bang model, or uh, egg pyrotic models, where you have to you have got a well-defined evolution on one side, well-defined evolution on the other side, but there is no dynamic. You have to put a new input in order to make a well-defined transition from the past Big Bang branch to the future Big Bang branch. That does not happen here. We do not need a new principle. For example, there is no hawking hartle boundary condition or any other new principle needed anywhere. Quantum Einstein's equations allow loop quantum gravity suffice. Also, this bounce is not caused by any phys unphysical matter. All energy conditions are satisfied, strong energy condition also. But what changes is the left hand side of Einstein's equation. This is the Wheeler David equation. Difference, differential equation is made into a difference equation. So, left hand side of Einstein's equation is modified because of quantum geometry effects and because of discreteness of the eigenvalues of geometric operators. And this is the main difference from the Wheeler David theory. But to compare with the standard Friedman equation, it is convenient to do just an algebraic manipulation. There's nothing in it at all. There's no physical input. And move the quantum geometry effect to the right-hand side. Then the equation looks like this. If you forget the green term, the equation I wrote down is a classical general relativity equation, the Friedman equation. Just says the, free, the, the Hubble parameter square, a dot by a whole squared, is equal to 8 pi g rho by 3. But now we've got a quantum gravity correction. Namely, it is 1 minus rho upon rho critical. And rho critical is about 0.41 times rho plan. Now, why is this important? Well, if we did not have this term, if we just had this here, then we can see that a dot by a whole squared is this. And matter density is always positive. Therefore, either a dot by a, so a dot by a will be square root of this quantity. So either a dot by a is positive or it's negative. If it is positive, 
Then you have got expanding universe. If it is negative, if you take the negative square root, you will get a contracting universe. But you cannot have transition between contracting and expanding universe because, because this never vanishes. But now we have got this correction and at rho equal to rho critical, this quantity vanishes, therefore a dot by a vanishes, therefore you can have a contracting branch in the past. So a dot is negative in the past and a dot can be positive in the future and therefore we can have a quantum branch. We can, as I mentioned before, you can construct rigorously the matter density operator and show that it has an absolute upper bound on the physical Hilbert space. And you can actually calculate what this upper bound is using constants which appear in loop quantum gravity. And substituting the values of this constant, we obtain exactly 0.41 rho plan. So we have got now an analytical explanation <coughs> of what were first numerical results. So this was a beautiful a confluence between analytical things and numerical things. And it provides a precise sense in which that is resolved. So quantum geometry creates a brand new repulsive force in the Planck regime, replacing the Big Bang by quantum bounds. Physics does not end at the singularity, and there is a robust phase of uh, superinflation immediately after the bounds. So there is a robust phase in which the universe, because A dot goes from negative to positive, there's a robust phase in which you can check that. There's a robust phase in which a double dot is positive just after the bounce, and that is really the phase in which you've got superinflation, expansion faster than inflation. There are many generalizations of this. One can consider more general singularities, so-called big rip singularities, so-called sudden singularities, and all these singularities are resolved in loop quantum gravity. You can also go beyond homogeneity and isotropy. You can have inflationary potential. You can have anisotropies and Bianchi models. And you can also have certain kinds of inhomogeneities, so-called Gaudi models, which have gravitational waves. And singularities are resolved in all these cases. So I did in detail a specific model just for the sake of simplicity. But in fact, there's a whole bunch of models that have been done in detail, in varying amount of detail, in which singularities are resolved. So now this resolution of singularities changes the paradigm. Namely, what we are doing is we are removing conceptual incompleteness. Um, there is a, the complete conceptual incompleteness was that there was singularity. Now there is no singularity, and therefore now there is a new paradigm. And it is, we can use this para paradigm because all physical quantities remain finite. So here is an example, application to inflation. First, I will talk about a conceptual issue, then I will talk about observational issue. Inflationary models have tremendous success particularly with structure formation. But these implications require a slow roll inflation with, say, 62, 70 foldings. So the, the scale factor at the end of inflation upon the start of the inflation should be about e to the 60 or e to the 70, enormous factor up here. So for example, during this inflation, if you take um, some like radius of a proton, that would actually inflate and inflation the size of so the question that we want to ask is, how natural is inflation? It's very successful in structure formation, but how natural is this? How did the inflaton get sufficiently high up on the potential, 60 to 70 E foldings, and as it rose down slowly? Now, in general relativity, it is difficult to set the initial conditions because we have got initial singularity. So therefore, we have this question. Even if a theory allows inflation, can we say that sufficiently long sufficiently long slow roll will actually occur with high probability. There has been a lot of controversy in general relativity about this issue, but recently Gibbons and Turak argued that in general relativity, the priori probability of obtaining n e foldings goes like e to the minus 3n. So e to 60 e foldings would be e to the minus 180. It's absolutely minuscule. If this were true, then this would put a tremendous burden on the fundamental theory as to why a sufficiently long slow roll inflation actually occurs. Life becomes much different in, 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 in this case. There are other conceptual issues. The paradigm shift in all bouncing models. For example, now there is no horizon problem. The universe existed forever before. And then there are phenomenological issues. A lot of these have been looked at by people. I just give you a couple of examples. People have calculated spectral tilts due to quantum geometry effects. For power law inflation, the loop quantum cosmology corrections 
are important at the onset of inflation and become negligible at the end. Uh, but what the result of all this is very small red or blue shifts, uh, blue tilts in the power spectrum. There are several, several such examples of conceptually interesting things. But observationally, these effects have been extremely, extremely small to be phenomenologically interesting because the missions we have got in the near future will not be able to see any of these effects. They are extremely small. But are there observational possibilities? So there is one possibility that I just want to talk about for a few minutes before I conclude. Namely, normally initial conditions, namely the adiabatic or the bunch Davies vacuum after inflation, for the inflation, are specified at the onset of inflation. These ideas have had great phenomenological success, but conceptually, this is a very strange time to set initial conditions. It's not the Big Bang, it's not somewhere, it's just at some stage in the middle, we say, well, matter fields are in this particular stage. I don't want to say it's not, cannot be motivated, but it's a very strange concept. So what you can do instead is to put the initial conditions at the big bound in loop quantum cosmology. And what we are doing is we are using quantum field cosmological quantum space time, a bunch of developed before. Use these quantum wave functions of space time, put quantum fields on it, and then we specify natural initial conditions for perturbations at the big bounds, and then we evolve. The question is, okay, this looks mathematically natural, but is it really viable? If I evolve, am I going to get at the onset of inflation conditions which are very close to bunch Davies vacuum so that phenomenologically I can still get structure formation I want? The answer to this question appears to be yes. But the second question is equally important, namely, I mean, this is surprising, but the second question is even more important, namely, supposing I do get something close to bunch Davies vacuum, but I may get something which is so close to the bunch Davies vacuum that the difference would never be observed. Then again, there is no test. So could it be that actually I start with these initial conditions of the big bounds, evolve for the perturbations, and I get something which is close to bunch Davies vacuum, but not so close that there are no observational differences. So it is close to the bunch Davies vacuum, not to be ruled out by observations today, but make predictions for future observations that this will be the differences. And it seems that the answers to both these questions are yes. Again, I want to say these are preliminary results. These are the, the main calculation has been done, but there are many, many other checks that have to be yet, yet to be done. So there's an exciting era in which something which is conceptually important, like resolution of singularity, seems to be leading to some observational predictions which might actually be checked in future meetings. Let me summarize. Quantum geometry creates a brand new repulsive force in the Planck regime. You see, this one might say, why is it that the universe, which was actually collapsing in the pre-Big Bang branch, suddenly expands again? In general relativity, if it was collapsing, it will collapse into a singularity. Well, it does so because of a new repulsive force. This new repulsive force is caused by quantum geometry, and we understand its origin pretty well now. So, there is actually a new physics here, which is caused by quantum geometry. Now, this repulsive force has a characteristic that we were thinking it should have, namely, it is extremely strong so as to overcome the classical attraction, but it is also extremely short-lived, so that general relativity is perfectly fine after about Planck density is about a thousandth of the Planck, uh, sorry, matter density is about thousandth of the Planck density. So it is extremely short-lived and extremely strong. I mean, this was very surprising for me. I mean, I would, if I had somebody asked me, write down some equations, we do this for you. I don't think I could have found these things. We just followed our nodes, which is look from gravity, applying quantum geometry ideas to cosmology, we found the difference equation, we put the difference equation in the computer, we worked it, I put it on this box, believe it, I kept the paper for six months, because we ran all kinds of tests on the numerics, and we found that it was robust, then it was published. And then the numerical calculation suggested, uh, analytical calculation, we did the analytical calculation, and showed that there is actually an upper bound to the density. So there is a coherence here, in all, uh, all across here, and what is happening is something new, and that new thing is that there is this new repulsive force. See, new repulsive forces of quantum origin are not new to physics. The Fermi, did not, the Fermi degeneracy effect that we have, that is what makes the neutron stars possible. Gravitation 
force is trying to squash the neutron star, the Fermi non-degeneracy is, is causing a repulsive. This is something that we learned from Chandrasekhar. It's causing this repulsive, and they are, they are balanced up there. But that repulsive force is of, or its origin is in the quantum properties of matter. And if in fact the neutron star has a mass more than 10 solar masses, that is not big enough, the, the star will collapse and will form a black hole. This repulsive force has its origin in quantum geometry. And it doesn't matter how big the collapsing mass is. It can be the whole universe. And yet, the repulsive force is strong enough to overcome the classical attraction and give us a bounce. So there's a new paradigm, namely, physics does not stop at the singularities. And quantum space-time can be vastly larger than what Einstein taught us. The long-standing questions I began with have been answered. Big Bang singularity is naturally resolved. There is no new principle that is needed. Quantum Einstein's equations allow loop quantum gravity suffice. The evolution is um, deterministic along the singularity. And what is on the other side is again a large classical universe, which is actually bridged to us by, uh, through, through a quantum break. OK. So there have been answered. Challenges to background independent theories, namely detailed recovery of the classical relativity at low curvatures and resolution of singularity, have been, have been actually met. Um, singularities analyzed are of direct cosmology. Detailed analysis in specific models so far, but taken together with the BKL conjecture, those of you in relativity know about this, um, they suggest the strong curvature singularities in general relativity would actually be all be resolved by this quantum. But of course, this is not, true. This is not a theorem, but there's a hope that this is actually true. Quantum also in to quantum gravity, the other way around. And there has been a lot of work in recent uh, last couple of years or so on the, in this particular direction, both in the canonical approach, the integral or the spin form approach, taking the results from loop quantum cosmology to provide hints as to how to do the theory. The frontier, I believe, is really inhomogeneous perturbations and phenomenology. And as I mentioned, first results have already appeared. There is a growing exchange between cosmologists and the loop quantum graph cosmology community. And hopefully, this will provide the transition. You see, in classical cosmology, we had the, if we had the Friedman um, and uh, uh, Lemaitre era, in which everything was mathematical and conceptually new things were happening. But physics was not understood until we entered the, the uh, nuclear synthesis and CAB. And I think that we're just beginning to make this transition from mathematical to phenomenological observational consequences in loop quantum gravity. So what replaces the Big Bang in loop quantum gravity? Broadly, it is Lemaitre Phoenix universes. Since the advent of general relativity, leading thinkers, which I, which I had already mentioned before, have expressed hopes and philosophical preferences. For example, Weinberg has said, you know, contrary to what standard religions might tell us, that in fact the universe was not created at some time, but in fact maybe the universe exists forever, and that's an elegant solution out of uh, the standard religious uh, beliefs. But in fact, these are all kind of but now, because the singularity and loop quantum cosmology equations provide a deterministic evolution from the pre-Big Bang to the post-Big Bang branch, what happens is not a philosophical preference, but the predictions depend on Einstein's equations and the cosmological parameters of today's universe. So basically, we're moving into standard type of science about what happened before Big Bang. I think conceptually it's very important what happened before Big Bang, but rightly, Physicists are very skeptical, saying, oh, you have these things, but so what? I mean, can we test the any of these? Things? But this is always the case, right? I mean, even Einstein didn't think that you know, lensing could be tested. When general relativity is born, people didn't think that those predictions, I mean, there was a mercury prediction, but any other prediction could actually be tested. So we are making a progress towards that, and we just saw that there is one hope that, in fact, one might be able to see um, in the inflationary scenarios. Um, the predictions of loop quantum cosmology being actually verified in near future. Thank you.
to thank on behalf of you, uh, Professor uh, Ashtekar, for this beautiful talk. I am sorry, I, I just want to take uh, two minutes of the time. Um, uh, Govindarajan actually sprang me a surprise, asking me to take the chair. So I had not even read the uh, morning program carefully enough. So I even uh, omitted, uh, unfortunately, to give a proper introduction to Ashtekar, but now it is not necessary. But in the same sense as he goes to even pre bank let me just mention, uh, you would have seen, I mean, he is the uh, world leader in the uh, uh, one approach, one major approach to the most important problem, fundamental problem in physics now, the uh, marriage of uh, <coughs> gravity with quantum mechanics, that is the loop quantum gravity, which he has been spearheading so successfully. You have all seen that. The, uh, so it's very appropriate that this meeting started with him. I think uh, <coughs> the other thing I wanted to mention was it was, uh, it was uh, uh, appropriate in another way. He already mentioned that uh, he was in Chicago and uh, studied uh, under Chandrasekhar. I just want to mention that I share that distinction with him. I was also a student of Chandrasekhar. I took a course on general activity in Chicago University when I was there. So with that, um, now uh, I want to open the <coughs> his talk for uh, questions and comments. Uh, Through this, and does the answer rule out oscillating universes? Yeah, so the good. so what happens with entropy? So, normally, when we talk about entropy in much of literature, one talks only about matter. So, here we have to take into account also gravitational entropy. Now, if I looked at just ordinary Friedman Robertson Walker model, then in fact, there are no dynamical horizons, it does, I mean, technically. But in the loop quantum cosmology model, what happens is that just near the bounds in the pre Big Bang branch, a dynamical horizon develops. Now, I have to include the entropy, which is the area of that as well. And this area grows, and at the bound surface, it is infinite. So, if you like, I mean, entropy is always obtained. We can talk much more detail, but entropy always refers to some coarse graining. And that coarse graining disappears at the bounds. And you have to reset the clock of entropy about this coarse grain. So conceptually, something new happens up here. Qualitative in the situation is similar for these closed oscillating universes, but there are also some differences. But I think I should talk to you privately about it because there are certain. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, you said when you, when the wave function evolves, you have to have the classical singularity. At some point, the density, I mean, at some critical density, you have departure from GR. What precisely decides this? And is there no. a link to uh, energy conditions? Right. No. So there's a departure from GR, sizable departure from GR. So what does it mean? It means that um, I have this wave function, and I got spread of this wave function. So what one can just look at is when does the, um, when does the classical GR trajectory at large universes, it is well within, within the spread of the wave function. As I go up here, the classical trajectory is outside this wave function. Um, so it really is that it is the criteria that is being used to say that, well, now, in fact, if it is outside the, the, you know, the wave function is Gaussian, so you look at the half width and it is outside that. And then we say that, well, this means that now I begin departure from GR. I mean, it is a qualitative thing. I mean, you, there's, no, there's no sharp regime. I mean, it's, like an, it's just like saying when is GR important? Well, it is important when in a curvature is of this order. I mean, I cannot say. Um, um, in some ways, the singularity theorems are being violated. The energy yes. conditions are always there. But yeah. yeah. And they are being violated because Einstein's equations are not true. I mean, because Einstein's, the left hand side, the geometrical side of Einstein's equation, it changed. The, that's, yeah, exactly right. So, thank you for asking this. So, the, the reason why singularity theorem is violated is because the geometrical side of Einstein's equation is now new. It's not the same. I mean, it is the. Uh, I, I, perhaps I should have written that down completely explicitly wh why it is new, etc. I just thought it would take too long. Okay. My second uh, question can I ask one more? Yeah. No, this uh, the new repulsive force when you marry the quantum and geometry. Now, can we have some intuitive feeling about yeah. this that the quantum uh, thing you see you can. Uh, yeah, the intuitive uh, held on to uh, uh, boil down to say exclusion exclusion principle as the yeah. cause for this. Similarly, for here, 
could we have some intuitive feeling yeah. about? So the, the intuitive feeling is, I mean, I, again, there are stages. And in this thing, I'm giving it kind of one minute answer rather than five minute answer. So the intuitive idea is just the following. It is very similar to what happens in type two superconductors, where the magnetic flux lines are kind of repaired, right? So it's similar to that. So what do I mean by that? You see, area is quantized. So what that means is that I got some flux line. I mean, I, so I want to know what the area is of this surface. So basically, I got this quantum geometry flux lines, and I have to calculate what the flux is, and that gives me the area. Now, if I try to try to put too many flux lines here, right? Um, that's not possible. That, that's that, that's basically the point. I mean, because the area is you are given me the area, and then I and therefore these flux lines are actually repelled from each other, and that repel repelling of these flux lines intuitively is what corresponds to this uh, this work. This should be, there are several stages in which this can be made very precise. But there's really repulsion between these flux lines of area that is what is causing this uh, repulsion. <coughs> Two comments here. You talked about uh, footprints of the quantum era, which are not quantitative. So can you be quantitative about that's one. Second thing is that obviously you have implications for dimensional reduction and holography. You are opposed to thing here. Can you comment on those? Okay. So what, what is the, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no dimensional reduction that is occurring here. I mean, in the sense that at a fundamental level, the space time is really like in string theory, actually is really fundamental quantities are too complex. So it's a two, two dimensional space time, or if you like uh, in space, it is just one dimensional. These flux lines of, of geometry that I talked about are really one dimensional, but macroscopically there's no dimensional reduction. The dimension is just Spatial dimension is three from the big, from the beginning to the end up here. Yeah, but footprints can be called quantity or what those things? You mentioned some other. Yeah. Ones, but so basically, yeah. yeah. Basically, what you want to do is the following: you want to consider certain. Okay. In order to talk about structure formation, what you do is you, you have to look at perturbations. These perturbations are represented by by such quantum fields. So, so basically. These are just perturbations, so they're just really satisfying wave equation. So you can just take a scalar field satisfying wave equation, and you quantize it into creation, annihilation, operators, etc. And what is important for the structure for formation is certain modes, some certain Fourier modes of this. So there is a mode which corresponds to which one says has just re-entered the horizon. Let's call it K naught. So roughly K naught to 200 times K naught. These modes carry the information about structure formation. So the question is what was the initial state of these modes. And what we're doing is we're, try, we're specifying the initial state of this mode at the bound surface using ordinary quantum field theory and using the fact that the Hubble parameter happens to be zero. It's a fact of loop quantum cosmology on the bound surface. So you use these two facts to give a natural initial state for these modes. And then we evolve it. You evolve this initial state. And it's linear, so they don't interact with each other. And the statement is that what happens at the onset of inflation? And then at the onset of inflation, there's another state that people use, which is the Bunch-Davies work vacuum. So this is not exactly Bunch-Davies vacuum. This is a Bunch-Davies vacuum together with a certain number of particles, populated by a certain number of particles, because it's a particle creation in the expanding universe up here. But the number of these particles created is sufficiently low, I mean, we had a clear estimate here, that observationally, today, this state is perfectly viable. But on the other hand, it is not so low that the future observations will not be able to distinguish. So future observations will be able to distinguish between this state, which is populated by certain particles uh, for this particular mode. So, so that is the quantity. Uh, can I ask it? It's not. Is it on? Yeah. Question. I understood that there is an orientation reversal as you go through the. No. That, that used to be what, what people uh, earlier, to, yeah, okay. boy wall, et cetera, was That's saying. That's correct. No. Okay. Second question I want to ask is, if you take a small, say, neighborhood of this region you're talking about, is space-time dis still described by a commutative system algebra, or it is changed? Yeah. So the algebra is never commutative in general relativity, right? I mean, the, uh, the space-time geometry. Space-time space -time algebra is no. So the, the, the metric is replaced. So this is, a, this is an important point. The metric is replaced by the triad fields. And these triad fields, they don't commute with each other. I mean, classically, the Ponzer bracket is zero. Do but they con module for a space-time system algebra? Or how do you recover space-time? 
you recover space time through effective theory. So the basically, there is an effective equation. So you actually, you have got this wave function, and it's a fact that this wave, okay, you've got this wave function. It's a fact that this wave function is sharply peaked. That's what computer simulations show. But then I go up here, and I say, let me get some effective equations, making some assumptions up here. And of course, a priori, I don't know if these, all these assumptions are going to be satisfied near the big bounds. I do not know that. But I take these equations, and I solve them, and I find, often happens in physics, that in fact the effective equations hold very, very well, even through the bounds. So this, we're to, when we talk about space time, we're talking about these effective equations. If you want to talk about quantum system, then we have to talk about these wave functions. Is there any C-star algebra replacing space time algebra, commutative algebra? Can I interrupt? There is, even in full loop quantum gravity, the algebra representing geometry is non-commutative. Just the two questions. Yeah, yeah. This, this, Priya, yeah. After that, um, so, um, Ajit, I was curious about, is the arrow of time essential to this argument? What is happening to time at the bounds? Yeah, so if we talk about, I mean, in quantum theory, as I was saying, that we really should talk about relational time. And so in this case, the time is being described by the scalar field. And the scalar field is continuously changing, is continuously increasing. Uh, so I take the effective space time, and in the effective space time, I got these light cones everywhere. And I can ask, and therefore there's a future, at each, at, once you have light cone, there's a future one. I mean, it's by definition, you say that this is future and the other one is past. And then I want to know continuously if I can talk about future everywhere. And the answer is yes, you can talk about future everywhere. So the orientation is not, neither the time orientation nor the space orientation is reversed as you go along up here. So it is completely time. Uh, what would be the effect of these ideas on stellar mass black hole singularities? So I think it is also true that the stellar mass or any mass black hole singularities are going to be are, are, are resolved by, by this thing. But in that case, the situation is, I mean, the analysis is not as detailed as, as it is in the cosmological cases, just because in that case you really have infinitely many degrees of freedom. I mean, because I got functions of R and T together, uh, even in the spherical symmetric case, I got a function of R and T together, and therefore you got inf it's a field theory, it's an infinitely many things. And therefore the uh, analysis is nowhere near complete here, so one just sees that the equation doesn't break down, but what are the predictions? I mean, there are predictions in literature. People say, well, I make this assumption, and I get these predictions, and so on and so forth, that in fact there is actually, you, you actually get certain solutions across the black hole singularity, etc. I do not know if this, I mean, it could be that they're perfectly fine, but so far they're not justified. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I did that actually at one stage, and the statement was that it was not so easy to test those predictions either in the future. Right? In the near future yeah. Is there any other short question or comment? We are running short, but I just yeah. want to ask one short question. Uh, do you have an explanation in loop quantum gravity for the scene uh, uh, acceleration of the universe? Is there an ingredient? No. So the statement is the current acceleration of the universe in loop quantum gravity, just like a, an ordinary thing. One would just have to put the cosmological constant, which happens to be small, and then that's the current acceleration. Sir, oh, sir, time is a, yeah, yeah, please. sir, time is a parameter, and sir, whether time is also quantized or something? No. So the statement up here is that um, you've got a scalar field, and you've got a, uh, the, say, the, the geometry. It could be curvature, it could be anisotropies, volume, etc., etc., all these things, okay? And then what one is doing here is using scalar field as a relational time. Okay. So there are two ways to play the game. One way to get, play the game is to say that, well, there's a timeless framework. I don't have time. I only ask for correlations. Then there's no time at all. The other way is to say that I identify the scalar field to be a time, physical time. It's called a relational time variable. Then it is called, technically called deparameterization. Once you deparameterize the theory, then the variable which this describes time is a parameter. It's no longer uh, uh, no longer an operator. Okay. Uh, this we can do even in ordinary Newtonian mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, etc., etc. There are two ways of playing the game, and one is a completely timeless framework where there's no time, there are only correlations between various observable, the other is a deparameterized framework. And here, the way that I presented things, I was using a deparameterized framework in which you have got uh, scalar field as being used as a relational time variable. So I think we'll close the discussion. And